My name is uh, Kevin Akeem Jacoby Johnson. I had a, a rough start that I kind of caused on myself. I had dropped out of school. I hadn't had a, a diploma or anything. Spent uh, nine years incarcerated. Went in at 18 years old, and I got out at 27, 28 years old. You know, being incarcerated or being a convicted felon, just coming out of incarceration period, and you feel like you have no opportunity. You feel like there's no option. I don't have any option. First, I need to work. I need employment. I got to I gotta make enough where I can live, and I got to make enough where I can pay my obligations. But I also know that I can have better for myself. Like, I'm better, I'm better than this. I'm going up here in the morning, and I'm, I'm gonna stand in front of this, this building until I talk to the right person. I told these people my situation, that I had been incarcerated and I was a convicted felon, and uh, that I would come here and, and, and work my hardest and, and do my best if I was given the opportunity. It give you responsibility, and I think that they have the responsibility that was given, it kind of uh, helped me shape my path in my life. I got a sense of direction now. I have hope. I have hope. And I can I can see a little bit better. Well, well once it was kind of blurred. I couldn't see. I'm thankful. I'm grateful. Good morning and welcome to Breakthrough 2020. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, we are about to start our panel on community collaboration and as you'll see in a moment, uh, we actually pre-recorded this session at a local church and had to social distance and wear masks. Um, we thought the conversation uh, being live would be more robust and uh, better. So hopefully the mass will not be too distracting. Uh, I'll say that Kevin's story, uh, no matter how many times I see it, it, uh, it gives me chills because it uh, really his story represents the, the people we're trying to help and the story uh, of this group working together that you're about to hear. So with that, um, I'll turn this over to um, to the session. And I'll just tell you, um, we are going to have Q&A after the session. So stick around and use the Q&A button at the bottom to, uh, to let us know what questions you have for our panelists. Thank you. Um, just want to say thank you to our panel uh, for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for joining us for a discussion on community collaboration. I'm Eric Cockling. I'm C, uh, General Counsel and Chief Program Officer at the Georgia Center for Opportunity. And at GCO, one of the things that we focus on is employment. Um, and one of the things that we know, and we all have learned, of course, and know, is that getting a job is not a simple thing to do. Um, in order to have a job and maintain it, especially to maintain it, you have to have some form of stability in your life. Um, it's required. And with COVID-19 and the economic shutdown that we've seen, stability is much harder to come by. And the families and individuals that were struggling prior to COVID are struggling much more so now, all right? So with that in mind, um, I'm very happy to have this panel uh, here with me to talk about a community collaborative initiative uh, that we've all been a part of here in Lawrenceville, Georgia, called the Lawrenceville Response Center. The members of the Response Center came together to help those families who were suffering the most in our, in our local community due to COVID-19 and the shutdown. And it's been a privilege really to be part of the group and to see the impact that uh, this organization and the work of these individual groups has had on our city. So with that, thank you all for joining me. And uh, I wanna turn things over to you guys first by just asking you to say who you are, a little bit about your organization, and then we'll jump into the questions and we'll, we'll start with ladies first. Okay. Hi, I'm Jen Young. I am the executive director for Impact 46, which is the fiscal agent and 
um, overall operations um, management of the LRC. Um, before COVID, uh, we really um, specialize in designing and building and facilitating partnerships that impact the community. And so um, we were a part of the beginning conversation about really responding to our community and taking care of Lawrenceville's most vulnerable families. Thank you. Tom? My name's Tom Baylog. I'm the executive director of the Lawrenceville Cooperative Ministry. We are a, a food bank ministry that's been serving the folks of Lawrenceville and Tequila since 1995. Um, uh, food is the main thing that we focus on. If we can help in some other areas, again, through a partnerships, uh, and we're always looking to do that, uh, we try to help where we can, sometimes uh, with uh, financial help and things like that. But our main focus has become food. Do what you do very well and partner with others that can help in other areas. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Ridgely? I'm Ridgely Haynes. I'm the ministry team leader for LEAP, the Lawrenceville Employment Assistance Program. That's the career ministry of the First United Methodist Church. And I'm going to take a little different approach because it explains what I'm all about. But my career uh, did not take a straight path by any stretch of the imagination. I was in higher education, career development, and student development when I lost my job. And then I lost my job another time. And so I went in a completely different direction. So I've got experience with unemployment, being on un unemployment. Uh, at the same time, I had some professional skills. A uh, year after we jo joined the church, what would pop up at LEAP as a career ministry? Um, so it's an all volunteer organization. So I jumped right in uh, because of my experience and my uh, expertise. And plus I wanna give back and uh, LEAP is designed to help people that are in career transition get the most out of their lives and their careers and follow their passions. Uh, we offer networking meetings. Uh, now we're doing them virtually. And when the opportunity came up to uh, work with the LRC to help their clients get employment, we thought about it for a while, and then we jumped right in because it's a population that we hadn't been serving before. Well, we're glad you did jump in. It was a ton of help, so thank you. So thank you all for that. And before we go on, I, I need to say a thank you to uh, the First United Methodist Church of Lawrenceville. That's, that's my church. That's where we are. It's Ridgely's, Ridgely's uh, home church as well. They're letting us use their stage, and so you see their, <laughs> their backdrop for their Sunday, our Sunday service here. So. Thank you to the church and Adam Hildebrandt, who pastors here. Um, all right, so we'll jump right into the questions. And this is a, the first question, and it's probably the most complicated one because there are like three parts to it. But they all seem to fit together. That's why I'm asking it this way. Let's talk about um, essentially what the LRC is, right, what it does, and sort of the goals that, that we all hoped um, we would see, you know, coming out of its work. Jen, I don't know if you want to go first. Sure, or? I can start. Um, the LRC, at, at, I think at its heart, is um, it's just a, it's a group of people, a group of nonprofits and churches and businesses um, that really came together very, very quickly to care for our community. Um, it started from Zoom meetings, <laughs> really talking about food and seeing the need um, as COVID was, was coming into Georgia and across the nation and seeing um, the effects immediately and how it was affecting a certain demographic first. Um, but we began to think larger and long term. And so um, we really saw that there was a need to um, combat the effects of housing in terms of um, rental assistance and even thinking about our unsheltered homeless and our sheltered homeless that were living in extended stay. We knew that um, the jobs that were going to be affected, the hourly wage gig, um, contract uh, economy would be affected first. And so we quickly raised money. Um, the city of Lawrenceville partnered with us and um, through our community, we raised $125,000 and they matched it so that we could begin serving Lawrenceville very, very quickly. Um, and that was long before grants came in and government assistance. Um, so we officially opened <laughs> April 14th and um, we uh, just created partnerships and allowed people to stay in their lane, as Tom was alluding to, and 
um, but in a collaborative and coordinated way, serve people in a very multifaceted and comprehensive way. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good that Jen went first. Her, her team, her and her team are the hub of what the LRC does. Um, when we got together at first and we were talking with food, you can only imagine prior to COVID, we were serving 100 to 150 families a week. Uh, at the biggest part during our spring break week, we served over 1,100 families in a week. And it went down to six to 800 families for a while. And we're still between three and 400 families. So we knew there was a bigger need that had to, that, that we call food is a stabilizing ministry. Um, people who are worried about where their next meal is, it's hard to think about where's food, where, where jobs and stuff like that. I'm just worried that we don't have food. We can help stabilize them, but we wanted to partner with folks to say, who's going to move the needle now from here? And how can we, if there's additional things we can do? And that's what her team has done is, is if there's a food need, they come and talk to us and we're able to address that. And like you said, staying in the lane is a perfect way of doing that. And when you get everyone who's good at what they do and somebody who's bringing that together, a team, uh, it's come together very well. I think we've just scratched the surface of what can be done. I look forward to, to, to future things like that. And you talk about money coming in. We were uh, blessed with a, with a grant to help with utilities. And uh, Jen and her team, again, are primary in helping us to be able to achieve and be able to do that. So it's, it's come together great. That's great. Excellent. I'm glad you went first because it, it, this has actually been a very excellent partnership, particularly working with the case managers. Um, they're, they're working 10, 12 hour days. And uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, it used to be to, to find a job and, a, and a, find a job, you just walk into an office and apply someplace. But now um, it, it, it's a lot more complicated. And what we, our volunteers help people with the te techniques and also building up their confidence because they're very, very often they're not confident about their skills, their, their past experience. They th they've done some fantastic things, but they just thought, well, it's not, that, not all that special. Um, speaking of volunteers, uh, we, when the COVID hit, we only needed about two or three volunteers to run the, 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 the uh, Zoom meetings virtually. So we had about a dozen volunteers that were looking for something to do. Well, I, I encourage them to look for something else to do and, that, and that's where the LRC came in. Um, and what, what we help with in conjunction with the case managers, finding out what their, what their barriers are and, and so on, is the one-on-one -on -one relationship um, is, is very important. And I think that's, that's why we've had, had successes, plus collaboration with the, with the case managers. Oh, that's great. So, you know, from my perspective at, at GCO, what I first the connection to the LRC really came through meetings that Adam, uh, Adam Hildebrandt, and Alan Hoskins started having here at our church uh, back in the winter. Uh, they were meetings basically for our group to start talking about how we could serve the community around the church better. You know, and, and you, some of you guys were actually part of those calls. And that's how I heard about the LRC effort, you know, and got pulled into it, and which has been terrific. And I'm very thankful uh, for the for the chance to work with the LRC. I think the um, for me, what I appreciate most, I say most because it's it's kind of everything. It's st the focus on stability first. It's recognizing that people can't go from abject poverty and having not enough food to eat or a place to live. Uh, to working successfully. It's just setting them up for failure. And instead, it's a logical process. And I attribute that a lot to you and Layla with the housing authority thinking through the process and saying, if we can get people stable, then they're gonna have a chance to get work. And that's, uh, that's the piece that we're trying to contribute to by giving folks the ability to create resumes and, and find job listings and that sort of thing. But to be perfectly honest, we couldn't do it without Ridgely's team at LEAP. <laughs> I think the thing that became clear to us immediately was that we needed people to work directly with the folks, that they needed a lot of encouragement and coaching to be able to move through the process of finding a job. So thank you for making what we do even work remotely. So appreciate that very much. Um, so second question I have for you, 
we've talked about what the LRC is, kind of what it does, that sort of thing. But, you know, at this point, what outcomes have you seen through your work? Do you have any, and especially, you know, statistics are great, and I need to hear those. We all need to hear those. But also, any stories that have come out of this effort that you want to point to? I'll go last this time. Okay. <laughs> 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 I mean, overall statistics, especially from a food bank, you know, a lot is just, you know, when the numbers start going down, maybe they start stabilizing. One of the biggest things we're seeing is we had so many folks come to see us that said, I never thought I'd be in this position. So it's, you know, it's, it's folks that, you know, and we always say, you know, to our volunteers, you can't judge people when they come in, what's, you know, what they're driving or whatever. Because I talked to one gentleman who says, you know, I had just gotten a promotion treated myself to a to a car and now I don't have my job and I never thought I'd be in stuff like this but the stories we're seeing is again when you stabilize them and you get them in touch with other folks that can kind of move them along we've had a tremendous amount of people that we have helped who have already stabilized and have come back and supported us through food donations money donations and even more so saying let me help by coming in and volunteering so when you see that and just see, you know, some of the things that are going on, I just shared before I came here, you're talking to somebody what's going on in the ministry and you turn around and they put a hundred dollars towards helping towards the, the thing. Uh, so really the thing we're seeing is, is people coming together. Prior to COVID, we would meet as nonprofits, but sometimes it was just, I stand here, I say what I do. This has really made us having to reach out, starting with those phone calls and then moving on those ideas and, and just staying in contact with each other, which is tough. And, and again, with, with how busy we've all been and see how much is accomplished now, i just excited at how that can, we can jump on that and continue to help more and more people. Oh, that's great. What, what I'm continually amazed at, uh, I had a conversation with one of my, my uh, job applicants I'm mentoring is the stamina these, these people have, despite all their um, all they're going through. Uh, like I said, when I was unemployed twice, the first time it got kind of hairy in terms of our, our uh, mortgage payment, but we had some assistance from, from other people. But these folks are just, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's a whole bunch of things coming together at one time, but they just keep on keeping on. It, it's just amazing. I have to check my notes on my success stories because this old brain sometimes doesn't remember everything, but uh, I guess I won't use the names, but one, one of the um, job ag applicants we worked with, um, one of our mentors worked with, um, was in the restaurant industry. Of course, that was, that was one of the biggest hits in terms of employment. Uh, she was down to working uh, two or three days out of the week. Before that, she had been a hostess. Um, and it got to the point where uh, she was almost out of rental assistance money. And, um, and she has a household with three, uh, three, including two children. And I believe she was staying in an extended stay ho hotel. Um, but with her leap employment mentor's assistance, she got a job working 60 hours a week. And she was able to save $1,500 from her first paycheck and then eventually moved into a permanent housing, a townhouse that uh, was near her dad so, uh, so her dad could see her grandkids. So that's, that's one success story. And another is a, an amazing woman that um, there were some family situations apparently with her parents. So uh, she got uh, full-time care of, of her, her four grandkids. And at the time, I guess uh, her husband and, and she um, were looking at adopting, but, but then they got a divorce. So, um, but she was working um, for uh, Walmart and the Money Center, and I think she was making maybe 12 or $13 an hour. Uh, but she needed something more in terms of uh, eventually getting into permanent housing. So with her mentor's assistance, she managed to find employment in the evening um, at Amazon uh, part-time. Uh, between that and Walmart, then she was able to get enough income um, to eventually get into permanent housing. Um, but a comment from our mentor, which I thought was, was amazing, was she's, a, she's, 
she's a winner, exclamation point. <laughs> so that, that, that's just a couple of stories of, of those that have been, been through um, real trials and tribulations, but eventually they make it. And originally, you, you all have worked with 60 plus individuals as part of your work with LRC. Is that right? Uh, Something maybe like that. more. Who knows? <laughs> I think, I, 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 we I, keep sending them. <laughs> I, I think that's right, based on based on what I've seen. And I, my point in saying that is just to say, you've got sixty stories like that. Mm. Exactly what you just said. And well, what I what I found find particularly um, gratifying is that um, most of our volunteers are employed. Now we've got a few retired people. Well, our, our newest volunteer. He told me, he said, well, I'm working more than I did, did when I was actually working because he's volunteering for a lot of things. Uh, but they're, they're giving their time and, and their expertise, um, and it, it's the volunteers that make things work. So that's, that, that's gratifying. That's excellent. Thank you, Rachel. Um, my favorite story is actually about a staff member. Um, we, uh, back in April and May, um, we had, that was our largest time of influx when everything just kind of really hit. The fear was at its max and, um, and you know, unemployment was at its highest. And so we um, were not able to do our summer internship program through Impact 46, but we were able to um, hire two interns. And we hired um, two interns that had just graduated from Central Gwinnett High School and brought them in and they worked extremely hard. They're both 18, um, getting ready to go off to college and yet they didn't get to finish their senior year well. Their summer was you know, spent working with the LRC and just hearing very difficult stories and situations. And um, where it hit home for them was when we were able to um, provide 55 laptops to um, LRC clients that were doing employment searches and that didn't have the adequate technology and um, I was away and, and they got to go and deliver the laptops and they came back and they put faces to telephone calls and emails and it switched everything for them and I think why that's incredible for me is these are 18 year olds who in an 18 year old's mind sees a community vastly different than we do but I just think about the impact that that's had on them and hopefully it will change the way that they live their lives when they're our age and how they're thinking about their community. So um, that's why it was important for me because I saw such a switch in, in the relationship and how important relationships are in all of this. And, and it really, they, bec they went from being just a person in an email to an actual person that was struggling and yet there was connection and there, was co there were common denominators and one of them lived very closely in a neighborhood next to them. So it's, it, w it became, I'm helping my neighbor. I'm not just helping a person. This is my community. These are our people. Um, so there was, there was ownership in a way that I'd never seen before in teenagers. So that's my favorite story. Oh, that's nice. From a GCO perspective, we've, um, we've had about 80 folks go in and, and use the system to create resumes and look for jobs and that sort of thing. And, um, the latest number I saw on people who'd gotten jobs is something like 35. I think that's right. It may have gone up a little bit, but again, originally your work and leap has contributed to that mightily, um, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. And we also know that tracking, tracking is tough. Uh, we suspect the numbers are higher in terms of how many have actually gone back to work, but it's difficult once you've lost, lost touch with people, right. you know? Um, one thing I wanted to, and this is, uh, hopefully not throwing you a curveball, but I wanna kind of go back a little bit and talk about the process. If I'm a LRC client, and you know this best of any of us, um, what is the process that I'm brought into and, and who do I see along the way? Well, you're gonna see lots of people. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna touch multiple people and that's on purpose. Um, is that's because our network is so robust. But if you're coming in for the first time, um, you're you know, visiting our website, um, you're filling out a request form that's very basic. And then um, Tom's wife, you're gonna get a <laughs> phone call from her and she's, uh, she's our newest member of um, the LRC team. We're very, very thankful for her um, and what she brings. Um, 
She's brought a lot of peace <laughs> and some structure, which is really nice in this time. Um, but you'll get a phone call from her and then she kind of walks you through the process. But what makes LRC very different um, is we need to verify that you're COVID related. And so that's really important right now. Um, and so in order for that to happen, that's kind of the most pressing need is to work with those that, are, that have been COVID impacted, whether it's through a loss of job or um, it's anything from being a single parent and having to leave your job because there were no childcare options or you had COVID. Um, there's multiple things um, that define that, that COVID impact, but you go through the system and then once we get the documentation, we um, again, find out what your need is. Um, and so we wanna assist you. We have ways to assist you with housing and rental, um, but now we can able to, we're able to do utilities through our partnership with Lawrenceville Co-op. Um, we can do childcare, um, but much more than that, what people also experience is we're not just doing a checklist, we do case management. And that's where Jan and Tony come in and do a phenomenal job of really walking with someone, checking in with them. They get tons of phone calls, texts. Um, we really want to help people get on um, into a pipeline towards self-sufficiency and sustainability. And that looks different, so it's personalized, and that's why case management is so important. Um, case by case, it's different. The needs are different. The, the pathway there is very different. The timeline is different based on what's going on in their life. Um, and so uh, once you come in, um, you kind of become part of the LRC family, and um, it just depends on where you're wanting to go and how we can really assist you. Oftentimes, poverty is um, a poverty of relationships, mm -hmm. right? You're, Poverty oftentimes is about just being isolated and not having social capital, friends, right. connections. And when I see successful programs, whether what LRC is doing or ones from around the country that we see, it's the ones that are successful are the ones that focus on those relationship mm -hmm. pieces, you know, and they actually make it central to what they do yeah. rather than just giving help for an immediate need it's like we want to know who you are and connect you with other people who will invest in you right so i, I see that being a really key piece yeah. of what we're doing and it's interesting because we find that the clients that are coming to us aren't necessarily used to that yeah. um there's a there's a level of distrust that's almost undefinable and yeah. so um, that's why Jan and Tony are so successful is we move at the speed and currency of trust. And so yes. if people can't trust us, they're not going to trust us when we say, go to Rise Kit. Like they're going yes. to be able to help you. Yes. Um, it starts with that relationship in order for them to move forward. Um, if we're going to refer people that trust Jan and Tony, they're going to go to Tom, even if they don't know him yes. because they trust our case manager. Same thing with, with Leap. And as we expand and grow, that's really... Um, at the root of what we do is there's there's got to be the trust in that that relationship. Yeah, and that, that that's obviously critical with the mm -hmm. employment mentors. And I, I'm a, a trained as a Stephen minister, and I think they're going through the same thing. That uh, the face to face is really the best because you you can see the body language and all that, and and they can see you. Um, but now we can't do that. So it, it, it's been kind of a learning experience in terms of how to develop that relationship, primarily by phone. You know, we're still in the thick of this, right? COVID is probably coming back a little bit, right? Uh, it's been on a lull, but it might get worse. Uh, the need is gonna continue. Maybe it gets worse because of foreclosures and other things. Uh, what do you see in terms of uh, lessons learned that you're gonna take forward, you know, with you as you as you work in LRC and, and do other things? I think my biggest lesson is, um, one, we're able to go further, deeper, wider through collaboration. Um, if we, so if Impact 46 um, had tried to specialize and be the expert in all of this, we would have failed. Um, there's just no way for me to learn and I can't be Layla. <laughs> um, nobody can. Um, she's incredible and she's, but she's our housing experts. I mean, if we have any, issues and we need connections it's she's just a phone call away so like the relationships um have have grown deeper the trust between partnerships and nonprofits and churches um i just want to see that expand and it's i think it's going to have to if we're really um if anything that's indicated is coming our way um 
the work is still going to be there. In fact, it's probably going to be greater. Um, and so there's, a, I think, a need to expand our services um, and to continue the work that we're doing, but do it in a much stronger and deeper way. Um, so now that we've made the infrastructure, um, we've been able to provide stabilization ser um, services. It's what's next in the pipeline. Um, how do we continue to help people long term? Um, how do we continue to stabilize them if a second wave is to come? Um, how do we make sure that they're, they're not vulnerable and susceptible to start all over again? And so I think that's kind of um, where we're putting our attention and our focus is um, really thinking long term in terms of not just COVID, but our community and how to continue to serve and help our community um, with dignity and honor that, that leads people towards their own goals. Um, we don't want people to be dependent on services like us, but if we can assist them temporarily and lead them towards their own self-sufficiency, um, they become the heroes of their own story. Yeah, I think uh, really is one is, is being fluid, knowing that, you know, right. you can't just say it's gonna be this way, it's gonna remain this way. Yeah. Change has happened so much on, on things that are going on. So, but at the same time, not to be afraid to try something and just, and just see what it does. You know, sometimes we have to, to brace our volunteers, you know, who love change. Yeah, so you just sit there and say, okay, we're gonna try something a little bit different today. I'm sure you're gonna have some said, comments, said, but if you can give us one day, just to see how it is, because we are still doing a drive-through service. You learn so much when you can sit with them. We really wanna get back to that and be part of that. But that's why, thank God for you guys, because you guys know a lot of the people I'm talking to. So I can call up Jan or Tony and say, hey, do you know so-and-so over here? What can you tell them? Because the same type of thing, we want to partner with them. We, we want to walk beside people. We don't want to pull them. We don't want to push them. So we want some responsibility. That's how we show the love. Love is shown through accountability. And then the, the biggest thing is always to remember that um, this isn't our ministry. This is, this is God's ministry. And I say it a lot and I'll say it over and over again. All we are is a conduit of two things, God's blessings and the generosity of our community. And we just take what we get and we share it with others. And we're learning along the way. We're gonna learn once we try to get them back inside. How, I think that's how we can start learning how we can serve them more. We talk to them outside, but it's still, you know, their cars run in, they're like, you yeah. know, looking at their gas exactly. tank. So there's a hurriedness there. So you guys being able to do that and shed some light on some of the folks is a huge help to us. So, yeah, in terms of being flexible too, it's it, it's been um, an experience, uh, and hopefully it, that's come across. Working, working with job seekers, uh, everything's topsy turvy. Like for example, job fairs. There are a lot of virtual job fairs, so we're we're doing a. Um, uh, um, uh, virtual networking meeting next month, uh, focusing on how you use LinkedIn, but doing that remotely in terms of developing your, your network. So it's, yeah, Speaking Think, of resumes, thinking outside think, the box. I think we can all put like, we are masters at adjustment. Because <laughs> that's all we've done since, you know, March and April is, you know, you plan and plan and plan, and it just, there are unknown variables and things that just keep changing. And so, um, flexibility and patience and resilience and the ability to adjust our new characteristics to nonprofits that I wouldn't say were necessarily the strongest things in our in our organizations but definitely have grown because of the situation. Sure. Well and I think because it's um, this has been very local and among groups that you know we either knew each other before we got in this or we were so closely connected that we knew everybody yeah. around each other so there was trust and I think that's helped everybody to adjust to changes. <laughs> you know, if, uh, if suddenly you're changing what you do and it impacts me, if I don't know you that well, it may not go over so right. good. great. But if I already trust you, like, okay, Jen has my best interests here and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna see what happens mm -hmm. and trust. Yeah. So that's important. And that really leads me to a question about scale. Like this is, um, this is hyper local. We're talking about the city of Lawrenceville. I have my opinion about this. I'm going to keep it to myself for a second. But what do you think about that? Is that unique? Is that a valuable characteristic of what we're doing here? Um, are, are, there, are there issues with trying to do this at a larger scale? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, because we have an audience for this, 
if they're we will uh, <laughs> if they're if they're looking at a you know wanting to do something like this or take some principles away from this would you tell them pay attention to scale you know we have a localized city specific model and the way it functions again is going back to trust um, and it's also going back to I think the beautiful thing is is we disagree on lots of things probably but we agreed on one thing and that's that we needed to come together and help our community um, and put all our resources towards doing that while um, being flexible and willing to adjust um, and learn as well and so I think if this were to be done in another city which I believe it can that's where it has to start is you have to know your networks mm -hmm. and you have to know um, you know what are you really what is your goal um, our goal was housing and then it started there and very very quickly it has just expanded to really think about employment to think about food um, and the reason that was important is if we just wanted to focus on housing we would have been one-dimensional and not thinking holistically about a person yeah. or a family and so um, I believe it can be contextualized into other places and cities but the network has to be strong and the relationships have to be there. So that's really where it starts is, is building those relationships. And you wouldn't see it behind the scenes, but I mean, that was years of us all just knowing about each other, knowing what we were doing, um, finding out, asking questions when we didn't know. Um, and so that was the foundation, I think, of the LRC. Um, but it definitely, I think, I wanna see it expand into other places. I think there's a need. Um, there's a need for county models. There's a need for statewide um, initiatives as well. But the power in a localized city specific model is that all your resources are right there. Yeah. And you, you get to pull them together to be really, really strong and to really serve the localized community. So. Yeah, I totally agree with that, that it's local people helping local people. So like you said, when she, that was my neighbor I was helping. And, and it could be on a bigger scale, but I like the idea of teaching others this model. So it's local churches, local businesses, so that when someone goes, they know what's happening. And, and if it's that local and you're talking to the businesses, they're gonna start going, you know, when we first kind of moved, we went out to just the square and said, hey, we've moved, here's what we do. So when your businesses know who to send people to and all that, um, when it gets a little bit too big, like I said, I think some things could be at different levels, but this of getting to know the people and they, you know, when they're driving to you or walking, we have a lot of homeless that are within this area and there's some great county wide things, but their centers are far away and it's hard to get them over there where they can come and be here. And, and like you said, start building that trust. These are people right here in my community. And uh, you know, you're telling them, yeah, I live right down the street too. So, yeah, there's something about help knowing that you're helping your neighbor, whether yeah. you're a, you know, a business owner and you're offering a job to someone that, you know, maybe under other circumstances you wouldn't have really looked at them again because of something in their history or lack of a skill. If you know that they they live across the street or down the road, like you're likely to give them a chance. And I, I just think things just work at that scale and, mm -hmm. and they fall apart at larger scale. And I totally agree with how you put it, so. Yeah, I think you mentioned too, like we haven't talked a lot about the involvement of churches and businesses and neighborhoods and the schools, but there's a communication that's also going around um, that, you know, I can get a phone call from a discovery counselor and now we get to have a much more specific conversation because we have a vetting system. Yeah. And we can tell you everything that's happened since the day they came we can tell you where they are, some struggles, you know, why it hasn't worked with us. Um, and so that's the, to me, that's the power of a localized community really working together um, is now we're all communicating on the same wavelength and we're learning about our community so that we can do more and we can do better. Um, and then also we get to see the impact in our community and celebrate that, which I think is really special. So um, when we get to see the effects of employment through this whole system, we all get to share in that and we get to celebrate because we've had some part, whether it was small or really, really big, we all got to be a part of it. And so it impacts our community and we want to celebrate that together. That's great. That's great. So one last thing I'll just bring up and you don't have to comment, comment on this if you haven't seen it at play, but you know, um, throughout COVID, 
anecdotally, we've heard that the assistance, the CARES Act assistance, you know, the weekly checks that people have received if they're unemployed, have discouraged people from getting work. And one of the lessons that we've learned is that we've actually seen that playing out more than just anecdotally, you know. And I guess if we have, we are likely to have legislators in our audience and others who work in government. And I would just say, you know, as we move forward with COVID, relief is going to have to happen at different times. And I would just, I would just ask that the ramifications of that be taken into consideration so that for anybody who wants to work and is able to, that they're not disincentivized, you know. Uh, I don't want them to be punished, but I also don't want them to be disincentivized to, to be able to take a job that sort of gets them on that, that path to self-sufficiency and, and taking care of their own needs, you know. And I don't know if you've seen that, but I, we definitely have, so I just wanted to. I don't want to steal <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, I think this is really where you see a weakness in a system that targets low-income families that are put in such a tough position of saying, if I go back to work, I'm gonna make less money than if I stay unemployed. Yeah. So if I stay unemployed until not knowing when the cutoff date was, which back then we didn't know that it was gonna end in the end of July, um, they were making more money, yet on our side, we're trying to push them towards employment. And it was really difficult, but when you, when you realize what's happening systematically, you sympathize with them and you're yeah. kind of like, I get it. Like, 100%. why would you want to lose income going back to work in a, in a place that you probably didn't want to really want to yes. work before <laughs> when you can sit at home, be with your kids and, you know, you're getting more money. That's right. um, that's so that's where, yeah, it, it makes a total sense. And so that's where the system is difficult and it plays well into housing. Um, so, I mean, if you are on subsidized housing and that's based on your income and they change it, if you go back to work, now your rent goes back up. So, I mean, there's implications across the board with employment, with housing, um, with the family dynamics. It affected child care. Yeah. If you were no longer employed, you couldn't get, um, you know, assistance with CAPS. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it affected them. Low, low income. I'm going to steal this. I stole this term from my friend Deirdre Cox. She says low income, high potential communities. Yes. That's exactly who we're working with and serving. Um, but they were stuck and we literally could do nothing about it. And it was so frustrating from our part because you're just kind of like, um, I understand a stimulus package. Yeah. I get it. I really, and we saw some people really did stimulate the economy. <laughs> yeah. They really did and they did not pay their rent. Um, we had some folks that really took advantage of that and they're, they're now facing those consequences. But a majority of the families that we have worked with were just in a tough place of, I can't go back to work and not make more money than just, you know, and so that's, that's really what we saw. And I think that's where, you know, if, you know, you're in that position and, and you're trying to make a hard decision, what does a stimulus package look like? How do we help long-term? That's even harder yeah. is how do we start to evolve in our systems that don't damage and penalize low income, high potential communities, Amen. tough, Amen. making them and forcing them to have to make difficult sometimes irrational decisions <laughs> um, based on how it's going to affect them if they say yes or they say no. Well, I, so. I've got a couple of comments on it. I, I think the problem in this country is the frontline workers. It, it, it's becoming clear that the salaries need to be raised. Um, and, that, and, and that's actually happening. Uh, Walmart now is reconfiguring the whole workforce. So they'll have people working in work teams and the team leaders will get maybe 18, 19, 20 dollars an hour. Um, so I think if, if that gets adjusted, I think that would help with some of that. And I, it, it was quite a while ago, because it was many, many years ago when we lived in Northeast Pennsylvania, uh, they worked out a, um, they had a women's program that worked out a program where they'd go through some training to get, get reemployed. Um, but uh, in, in terms of their uh, either wel welfare or un unemployment, um, that wouldn't be reduced until they were working for a while because it, it, like the issues with, with child care. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. It need, the, the whole system needs to be adjusted to, to um, be more appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat>
Yeah, just two, uh, just two quick things. Same type of thing is, is you know, how do you, you know, that's that walking beside. How do you encourage them with some incentive to continue to work with, I don't know, some kind of supplements or something like that. But in the long run, they've done a, us in a way is a little bit of a disservice because when those funds run out, there's going to be another run on uh, help with rent, help with jobs, and we're going to have that rush at one time again. But at the same time, like, I think what's great about even going back to our model is now we know the person's story, especially if they worked with us. So if they come back, yeah. we get to have a much different conversation. Exactly. Um, so we get to have a conversation on those hard things like, you know, why did you choose not to go back to work? Well, I can assume you're lazy or you can tell me what's actually happened. Yeah. And I go, oh, my gosh, I had no idea that was happening. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of people don't understand the complexities around um, the choices that certain families have to make. Yes. And so there's a lot of assumption and it's wrong. Um, and it's, it's hurting even just when we're talking about neighbors, it's hurting our community because we're assuming the wrong thing. Right. And so where we could really put our efforts is in changing policy and systems versus making wrongful assumptions on families. That's right. And, so. and the nice thing about a, a local and highly relational response to need is that you can actually work with people through those difficult decisions and help them understand why you might forego a short-term financial benefit for a long-term plan at self-sufficiency, right. Right. right? And if you're just giving things to people without the relationship, you never have that chance. Right. So that, that's, what, that's why I love this model so much. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much for being part of the panel and it's look it's been a pleasure working with you guys and uh, getting to know you and I appreciate your heart for the people that you're all serving like I know it comes from just a genuine place of wanting to help so thank you very much you. I want to thank the panel for a great uh, session and I want to quickly turn this over to questions because we really don't have very much time for questions at the moment uh, I want to welcome our panel. Uh, we have a little bit different mix of folks um, because of some things that are going on. Uh, Tom Baylog, who runs the Lawrenceville Co-op, was unable to be with us because of an emergency um, at his organization that he had to deal with today. And then we also have Layla Prozaka with us from the Lawrenceville Housing Authority. She has been a key player in the Lawrenceville Response um, Center effort. And so it's great to have her with us. And we also have Jen Young, who you saw on the video, and Ridgely Haynes um, also on the video. So thank you guys for being here. If you have questions, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A. I see some questions coming in now. Use the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll tee those up for questions. Uh, before I get to those, Layla, because you're um, this is the first time people are seeing you, I wanted to give you just a minute or so to explain what role you've played and what the uh, Lawrenceville um, Housing Authority has played in this uh, LRC effort. Um, I, let me just give you a little bit of background about what we do. Um, we manage and develop affordable housing and all of our programs are um, really um, centered around long-term sustainability for the families and the neighborhoods. Uh, for example, our home ownership program, we've helped over 70 families get into um, their, you know, become first time home buyers um, and after we did some calculation, after seven years of running this program, we've created over a million and a half dollars in equity for these families that can be used now to build that intergenerational wealth. So I've worked with Jen on separate projects before, but I was, we always were looking to connect maybe on something that we could collaborate on. Um, I think uh, what I really like about this initiative and all of the partners here, we share that focus on the community long-term sustainability. Um, so it was really my pleasure to be part of this um, initiative. Um, what we did is on our end, um, we helped bring some of our strategic partners um, like Pad Split, um, Village of Home. I've had the uh, Village of Hope volunteers, Jan and Tony. I've had the pleasure of working with them through our transitional housing program. And I think they were crucial really being that kind of boots on the ground um, that would give us feedback so that we can adapt and adjust our programs um, to meet the needs of the families. Um, in terms of funding, we also um, brought in um, our grant writing experience and um, uh, our, we helped with $250,000 from the New Story Charity Grant to fund the initiative uh, before, um, like Jen said, 
four or five months before any of the federal funding became available. Um, so that's it. And if you have any questions, just uh, let me know. That's great. Thank you, Layla. So we do have a question here from Sarah Keenan. Uh, she asks, and this is for anybody who wants to answer, can you share examples of ways that you build trust with people over the phone or virtually since you can't really meet in person like we used to? Anybody want to tackle that one? Yeah, I think um, I'll speak on behalf of our, our case managers who are doing the phone calls, um, but it, that's the difference between a checklist and case management. And so we really come at it from the approach of um, really getting to know the person and hearing their story. And so we have to become experts in listening um, and not doing all the talking. And so um, very quickly, we just establish, I think, even expectations of the relationship if you're going to work with LRC. Um, and so that's, um, it's a high volume of talking on the phone um, and really helping them progress forward. So there's, um, we set the expectation that we want to work with you long term and not just um, provide the financial assistance, but um, really be a person that you can lean on and talk with um, through this whole process. That's great. Excellent. Ridgely, it looks like you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, in terms of the initial, but certainly the follow-up calls, I think what builds trust is if the volunteer offers to do something such as contact a person that might be a good referral, is to actually follow through and do that. Excellent, very good. You know, I hate this, but we have, we're running out of time <laughs> and I, in order not to damage uh, the schedule and throw off other sessions, I would, we're gonna have to leave it here, unfortunately. And I'm, I'm sorry to you guys that we've done this um, with the time. That said, uh, if you're interested in learning more about the work of the LRC or the model that we've been using, please feel free to reach out to any of us. I know we all would love to talk about it and tell you more. A uh, lot of lessons learned, uh, sometimes the hard way, uh, but it's been a terrific effort and a lot of good outcomes uh, being seen from it. Thank you to our panelists. I appreciate you very much for taking time to be here. I know it's been a commitment to be part of this. So thank you. I uh, appreciate your work, uh, as I said in the, the session when we met. And thanks to all the, the folks watching this.